Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and seeking them or asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed and his understanding and, and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in a great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Well, it's a pleasure to get to open up God's Word. Uh, if you have a Bible, if you want to go ahead and turn to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, you'll have some time to find that. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 1 during our time together. But just in case you don't know anything about Turkey, let me give you just a little info so you know who it is that's talking to you. Uh, like Ben said, I'm from Texas originally. I've worked in Washington, D.C., uh, both as a, I was a research scientist at Texas A&M briefly, and then worked in science doing stuff with the government for a while, became an elder at the church that I was at, eventually came on staff as one of their associate pastors, did that for about 15, 16 years. Then, uh, like Ben was saying, uh, back in 2020, we moved to Ankara, Turkey and planted Chankaya Baptist Church. It's an English-speaking church in the capital of Turkey. So our congregation is made up of, we have some Turks that come along and Iranians that live there, but also expats that are from English-speaking countries, but then a lot of folks that are from countries where they speak English as their second language. So we have folks at our church from places like Russia and Zambia and the Philippines and, yeah, South Korea and, yeah, a lot of other places, Brazil. Um, so it's an international congregation that speaks English in a Turkish-speaking country. And if you're curious why we do that, uh, one, we just think having a good gospel-preaching church in any language is a good thing. Uh, secondly, just because kind of the world's second language is English, and even in a place where there aren't a lot of native English speakers, it's often the language that Christians can gather around. Uh, and also, we want to do it particularly in Turkey because uh, you may not know, but Turkey is arguably one of the least evangelized countries in the world. Uh, you know, it surprises people, but folks that say they know these things, like Operation World or Joshua Project, some of these organizations, they'll say there are more Christians per capita in Saudi Arabia or in North Korea than there are in Turkey. Uh, there's a lot of reasons, both I think some, some sort of anthropological reasons, there's some historic region, reasons. Ultimately, there's just God's purposes and providence. But Turkey's a country of about 81 million people, and folks say there's just a few thousand Christians. They estimate it's like two one-hundredths of one percent Bible-believing Christians. So we love the opportunity to be a light and an outpost for the gospel in a place where most people have never even known a genuine Christian. So certainly when you think about us, pray for Chankaya Baptist Church. Uh, in the capital, Ankara, of Turkey. And I'm uh, happy to talk to you about that more afterward. But this morning, I wanted to open up and get the privilege to preach to you from Daniel chapter 1. We're going to read the whole passage, but uh, 
just don't be scared. Long passages don't necessarily mean long sermons. So we'll just be hearing probably more from God's word and maybe a little bit less from me this morning. And hopefully that'll be edifying to everybody. So let me, let me turn now and pray, and then we'll turn and look at Daniel chapter 1. All right? Let me pray for us. <coughs> Father, we thank you for the chance to gather around your word. We pray that you would bless uh, the preaching of your word, and that you'd encourage us through the truths that we see in your word. And we pray that you would help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, to kind of get us into our passage, I wanted to ask a question of you for you to think about. How, how should we think about our personal circumstances when bad things happen? You know, not just like, not really just like inconvenient things that we don't like, but, but even like big bad things, like national bad things, or, or things that are really substantial in our life, like a, an economic downturn that maybe causes you to lose your job, or a a pandemic that causes you to lose a parent or some sort of malicious lie about you that causes you to lose your reputation or a, a move where you have to relocate somewhere. It causes you to, to lose relationships and friends. You know, how should we think about it when things happen that are difficult or costly on a sort of a bigger scale? Well, People have asked that question for a long time. How should we think about it when difficult or bad things happen? Back in 1981, a, a guy named Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote a book that hopefully none of you have ever read, but, but it's certainly famous. It's a classic book entitled, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. He kind of coined that phrase. And in the book, I think he genuinely intended to comfort people and to kind of protect God's reputation by looking at bad things that happen in the world. And then uh, he said this, quote, he said, God does his best and is with people in their suffering, but he's not fully able to prevent it. One, one person who read Rabbi Kushner's book wrote this in his review of the book. He said this, he said, I chose to read this book after experiencing a recent loss of a loved one. Not a good idea. I was looking for comfort and didn't find any. The author continuously wrote of how God is powerless to do anything to help anyone. He wrote of how prayer is of no use except to give you strength to carry on. He kept reiterating how God is as sad as we are over the evil and pain in the world but he's powerless to do anything about it. I, I don't know what you think about God and bad things and why they happen, but I can tell you that, that what the Bible says about God is just about 180 degrees different than Rabbi Kushner's personal opinions. The Bible says that God is totally in control, that he's in control even of apparent disasters and bad things that happen. And the Bible says that God works through the troubles that happen to his people, both to accomplish ultimate good for the people that trust in him and to bring glory to himself. Well, to, to, to kind of plumb out that idea, I want us to turn to the Bible and look at one particular part in the book of Daniel uh, a book, you know, over 2,400 years old. But in it, we read about how God is completely in control, even in troubles. Now, to, to give you just a little bit, bit of background as we turn to Daniel chapter 1, uh, this book was set in about the year 605 B.C. And what had happened, the, the nation of Judah, the, the southern part of the sort of divided nation of Israel, uh, they had been warned that they would remain in their land, in their homeland, as long as they continued to obey God as a nation and faithfully serve him. Um, but they didn't do that. And so God's sort of 
temporal in time and space. His judgment on that nation was for the Babylonian Empire to come in and their sort of erratic king, a guy named Nebuchadnezzar, to carry away some of the Jews into exile in the city of Babylon, which is located now in the modern country of Iraq. Well, among those youth was a guy named Daniel. He was probably in his late teens at the time, maybe early 20s, when he was carried off to this foreign capital, off to the, to the east of Jerusalem. And later in life, this guy Daniel wrote a book. He wrote it both partially in Hebrew and partly in the language Aramaic. And it tells the story of his exile and about God's faithfulness, even in the midst of all this sort of national disaster that was going on in, in Ju Judah. And we know, we know that this book was written by Daniel, though some people have asked questions about it, uh, because he calls himself the author in chapter 8, and because both Ezekiel and Jesus referred to Daniel as the author of this book. Well, the, the passage that we're going to read this morning, Daniel chapter 1, tells about where Daniel, as an old man, is looking back on his experience in Babylon, and he's, he's talking about what happened to him, and, and the section kind of breaks neatly into two parts. So what we're going to do, we're going to read the first part, talk about it a little bit, then we're going to read the second part. Um, the first part, he makes a really strong point in simply saying this, that God rules over troubles righteously. Even in trouble, God remains righteous, and he rules over them. So if you're the kind of person that takes notes when you're listening to a sermon, that would be the first point. The first point of the sermon is going to be verses 1 to 7. The Lord rules over troubles righteously. So let me, let me turn now and read that to you from Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he, Nebuchadnezzar, brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Aspenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate, and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of this time, they were to stand before the king. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. But now, e even with my little bit of background, you, you may wonder... Why did this happen? Like, why did God, because he seems to be, it seems to be God that's the agent at work there in verse 2. Why did God give Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands of this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar? And why did God allow even some of the, the sort of sacred vessels from the temple in Jerusalem to be carried off to this pagan king? Well, Jeremiah the prophet tells us about it. And one of the things, if you're reading through the, the Old Testament, you'll find there are, there are books in the Old Testament that are kind of commentaries on things that are going on in other books in the Old Testament. And Jeremiah writes about why this event happened. You don't have to turn there in your Bible, but you can just listen. And this is what Jeremiah says about the reason for this exile. It says, this is what the Lord of Armies, the God of Israel, says. I'm going to bring such a disaster on this place that everyone who hears about it will shudder because they have abandoned me and have made this a foreign place. They've burned incense in it to other gods that they, their ancestors, and the kings of Judah have never known. They have filled this place with the blood of innocence. They've built high places to Baal on which to burn their children in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal. 
something I have never commanded or mentioned. I never entertained the thought. So it's good to recognize that, that this exile, the conquest by the Babylonians, it wasn't just a, a national disaster, like something really bad that happened, but, but underneath and behind it, it was actually God's judgment on the people of Judah for the terrible things that had happened. So God, through Daniel, leaves no mistake that he's the one that's behind this when Daniel writes about it. If you look back there, if you got your Bible open, in, in chapter 1, verse 2, we read that the Lord gave King Jehoiakim, and he gave them, the vessels from the temple, over to Nebuchadnezzar. So one of the first things that's good for us to notice in this passage, it's right there at the very beginning in verse 2, that, that even in this apparent defeat, in this terrible thing that happened, that the Babylonians conquered Judah and carried these people off, even in all of that, it wasn't something that just happened to God's people. But it was God at work, working out his purposes. And for those of us particularly that may be here today that are Christians, it's good for us just to be reminded that while, while God does not explain to us why things happen, God is sovereign and reigns over everything. He reigns in righteousness. And also, it's good for us to remember, particularly if you're here and you're not a Christian, to know that the world's opposition to God's people, it never ends well. It's good for us as Christians to know that God reigns and rules over everything. And it's good for us to remember that, that even when, when those who are opposed to God and to his people, even when they seem to be on the ascendance, they seem to be winning, everything seems to be going their way, it's not going to end that way. And it's interesting. If you read, and you could sit down this afternoon if you wanted to, you know, It'd be better than anything I suspect you're intending to watch on TV. Or, you know, if you wanted to sit down and read Daniel chapter 1 to 6, you'd kind of get the whole story of how these things worked out. And if you did that, you'd find out that, that even while Nebuchadnezzar seemed to be winning, he was actually just sort of gathering fuel for the coming judgment that God was going to make against him. Daniel, Daniel knew what he was doing when under God's inspiration he wrote this book, and he, he wrote down this one little detail that's kind of interesting. Did you ever did you notice there at the end of verse 2 where it says that Nebuchadnezzar carried off some of the vessels from God's temple to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. But if you read the rest of the book of Daniel, you'll find that what, what looked like Nebuchadnezzar taking a trophy home was actually kind of like a time bomb that he'd unwittingly brought to Babylon that was going to work out in God's judgment against the Babylonians. Uh, we don't have time to read through all of it, but let me just read you a couple of excerpts from later on in, a <coughs> in the book of Daniel. And to, to think about those excerpts, it's helpful to, to think about the story of the Trojan horse. I don't know if you, ever, you guys have ever heard that story. I mean, it's, it gets replayed all the, all the time. One of the interesting things from living in Turkey, the city, Troy, where the story of the Trojan horse, you know, for the city of Troy, where it takes place is just up on the northwest coast of Turkey. You can actually go to the city of Troy, and they have a giant reconstruction of what they think the Trojan horse might have looked like. But if you're not familiar with that story, the, the Greeks, they're involved in this long going war. They're laying siege to the city of Troy. They can't get inside. So they apparently give up and they just retreat. And they leave behind this big giant horse that the people in the city of Troy think is like a kind of a goodbye gift or we give up or something. So the people of the city of Troy go and they take this big horse they built as sort of the spoils of war, like, look, we beat the Greeks, we're going to bring this into the city. Well, they didn't know that the Trojan horse, supposedly, was actually full of Greek soldiers hiding in there. And at night, 
The soldiers came out. They opened the gates of the city. The Greek army that was actually in hiding came in and conquered the city of Troy. Uh, you can read about that in you know, Greek, uh, Greek stories if you want to. But the point is those vessels in Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, were kind of like a Trojan horse. Uh, see if you, if you note this. Because God delights to use sort of apparent weakness and seeming defeat and apparent reversals for his plans to just highlight his wisdom and the fact that he reigns over everything. So decades later, when a new king was ruling in Babylon and he was, God was ready to judge the Babylonian Empire for their cruelty, uh, we read this later on in Daniel 5. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of them. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his forefather, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought so that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple from the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and stone, of silver, bronze, wood, and iron. Well, later Daniel is called in and he speaks to this king and he says to the king, you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them and you've praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. And so a few verses later in chapter 5, we read this. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. And with that sort of understated description, the Babylonian empire, for all its supposed glory and permanence and power, came to an end and never rose again. That was the end. Well, I stress all that. I know that's a lot of reading from other places, but so you can see that Daniel, when he's writing verse 2, Daniel, who had lived to be an old man at this point, he, he remembered everything that was going to happen You know, when he was writing that. He remembered what happened later on, and he wrote that little note, I think, about the vessels being brought and put in the temple Nebuchadnezzar seeming to triumph, but all he was doing was transporting for God the instruments of God's ultimate judgment on the Babylonian Empire just a few decades ahead of time. It's good to remember things like that from God's word, to recognize that if you were a Jew alive in Daniel chapter 1 verse 2, that looked like sort of the ultimate desecration of God's house. But if you were alive maybe 50 years later, you'd realize, oh, that was just God beginning to lay the groundwork for his judgment of the Babylonian Empire. And friends, we don't live 50 years in the future. You know, we live right now, and we, we don't see clearly what's going to happen. We don't see clearly what God is intending to accomplish through what seem like you know, terrible defeats and reversals, things that we don't like. But I think God records things like this so that we can look back at them and learn from them and recognize that God always rules. And even those things that we look at and we think, you know, oh no, this is tragic. You know, God is at work through those to accomplish his good purposes. God's always at work, you know, even discouraging reversals and failures and plans that don't turn out like we would like them to turn out. Those things maybe decades later will be evident to be good purposes of God to accomplish things for his people. It's a good thing 
it's a good reminder for me as someone who lives and works in a place where there's not a lot of triumph for God's church. You know, Ben mentioned we, you know, our our tiny church is thriving on sort of a Turkish scale, but Turkey's a place where there are very few churches. You know, I think I personally know, I don't know, a third of all the pastors in this country of 81 million people. Um, churches are tiny. You know, our, our church is seen as being a fairly large church because we have 50 or 60 people on a Sunday. You know, most churches in Turkey are 15 or 20 people meeting in a rented shop or you know, in some home. It, it's not a place where God's church seems to be triumphing. But it's a great place to remember that God's causes always triumph. We don't have to worry about that. You know, we, we may not like our circumstances. We may not understand why certain things happen. But we can look far into the future and we can know that God is working his purposes out and that he will accomplish his purposes. And especially for those of us who are Christians, it's important for us to understand this seeming defeat as God's sort of plan and theme for working out his purposes because that's, that's really the central message of Christianity. The, the whole thing that we hope in as Christians is that through apparent defeat, God works out his greatest victories. And we have the story of Daniel as one small foretaste. But if you're here and you're a Christian, I trust you know like the, 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 the sort of foretaste of the story of Daniel was just pointing to what God intended to and finally did accomplish on the cross. When God sent his son Jesus into the world to live as a weak human being to in an apparently humiliating position of living as a finite human just like us, that God, God seeing the sin and rebellion of his people didn't just destroy us as he could, but he sent his son Jesus into the world to live the perfect life that none of us have lived. But then, instead of everybody recognizing Jesus and worshiping and honoring and obeying him, the people at the time despised Jesus. And ultimately, they, they killed him by crucifying him on a cross. And all of God's plans seem to have been totally defeated. But then we know that three days later, Jesus was raised from the dead to show that the sacrifice that he made on the cross was actually sufficient to pay for the sins of everybody that would turn and trust in him. But even in that, the watching world, I think, thought that this whole Christian thing was kind of a failure. You know, the, the disciples had been scattered. Jesus had died, but there were these stories going around that he was alive again. But little by little, God began to show his wisdom that this apparent defeat was his plan to both secure the salvation for everyone who would ever trust in him and to work out the establishment of his people in local churches like this one so that a couple of thousand years later, you know, I don't know how many Christians there are in the world, but there's a whole lot more than 12. There's a lot more than 100. And they're gathering as God's people all over this planet today. And God's apparent defeat on Easter Sunday has turned out to be God's wisdom displayed. If we're, if we're a Christian, that needs to be one of the central ways we understand God's dealing in the world. He, he did it with the nation of Israel when he chose the least of people to be his people. He did it in Daniel chapter 1 when he allowed apparent defeat of the nation to be just the beginning of his judgment of the Babylonian superpower. He did it most supremely when he sent Jesus to die on the cross and to secure life for his people. And God continues to do that. He says that, that the church appears to be a small thing, like a, the gospel at work, like a mustard seed that is just a tiny seed that grows into a huge tree. So if if you're the kind of person who feels like something has to be 
obviously visibly successful really quickly, you're just going to struggle with being a Christian because that's just not generally how God works. God works in ways that confound the wisdom of the world. He works in ways that makes people think that they're beating him when they're not. And he's going to probably work in your life in ways that are sometimes going to be difficult and painful, but are going to require you to understand that his promises are true and he will be faithful and that he rules over disaster righteously and for his own glory's sake. That's really what he points out in the rest of our passage in verses 3 to 7. You know, these faithful men that we're going to see show themselves faithful. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they're named later, you know, they, they don't escape trouble. These guys are deported, they're displaced, they're in danger, they're challenged. All of Daniel 1 to 6 is just kind of the stories of how bad things happen to them, and then God works through it for his glory and for their ultimate good. But it's not a story of them avoiding trouble all the time. Well, God is gracious, God rules, and even in trouble, he's working out his purposes. We can see that by looking in the past. We can't really see that in our own experiences. That's why we need to to read things like Daniel and to read the Gospels and to, to fill our hearts with the Christian hope that God will continue to accomplish his purposes and his promises in the future, even in circumstances that we don't understand or like. Uh, you know, my, my father died when I was 14. He was a, a godly man, had us in a, a good church. Um, you know, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He got cancer. He died. It was, it was not, you know, a fun thing for our family. And, you know, that was, that was about 36 years ago, well, no, that's a big problem. That would be about 40 years ago that that happened. And I can't stand here as a 56-year-old guy. I can't stand here and say, oh, now I can finally see what God was accomplishing in that. You know, I, I can't say, oh, I can see now why it was a good thing for my dad to die when I was a teenager. But I know enough things from reading the Bible and supremely from what God did in Christ in the gospel that I'm confident if God chooses to reveal it to me, I may someday understand why God was doing good things. But I don't want you to think because I say this that that there's necessarily going to be a day come when you go, oh, I can see why it was a good thing that this person died. Or I can see why God was working out a great purpose when our house burned down. Or yeah, that we're not promised that, but we are promised that God always rules righteously and that he's always faithful. And we supremely anchor our confidence in that, in what he accomplished on the cross through Christ. And we're encouraged to see the pattern that God is doing by looking back to stories like this in Daniel, where we see God working through terrible circumstances to bring about good purposes. But even as much as it's good for us to think about that, one of the great things that we can hope in is that even in a fallen world like this, it's not all trouble and disaster. God also, even right now in our lives for his people, he also rules over blessings graciously. And that, if you're a note taker, is the second point for the sermon. And there's just two points if that gives great hope to you, all right? The second point is just this. God rules over blessings graciously. Even in the midst of trouble, God still blesses and cares for his people. And that's what we read about in most of the rest of this story in verses 8 to 21. Listen as we read the rest of Daniel chapter 1. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to devile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has assigned your food and your drink, for 
Why should he see you in worse condition than the youth sir of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were in better appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded them that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Well, that's what we see in verse 9, that, that God, even in trouble like this, God rules in grace and in blessing. And we see that in a bunch of examples of how even in the midst of this sort of national disaster, God is still showing himself kind and caring for Daniel and his friends. We see that in verse 9. If you look down there where, where it says, God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Uh, we see examples of that in verse 15, where we see that at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. Uh, we see it in verse 17 and 20, where as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in visions and dreams. Well, the, the point is that God was showing himself faithful and kind to Daniel and his friends, even in the midst of an ongoing, you know, not yet ended, sort of national disaster affecting the people of Judah. And just as a quick side note, you know, I... I feel bad saying this, especially for the moms that are here that may want to sometimes use this story to encourage their kids to eat their vegetables. You know, the, the, it, the point is not sort of the Daniel diet. The point isn't what Daniel and his friends were eating, because if you'll notice, we're never told what the king was feeding them. We're never really told what they ate. The, the Aramaic term for what they were eating that's translated vegetables literally just means food that comes from a seed. It, the point is just they weren't eating the king's food. They were eating something else that was simply God's produce. You know, it was just making the point that all of their abilities came not from the Babylonians, but it came from God so that he'd get the glory. But with all that said, kids should still eat your vegetables and listen to your mother. But the point is... God's grace at work, helping his people through their trouble. But a as we conclude, it's still good to recognize the nuances of how all this works itself out. God is clearly showing himself faithful to Daniel and his friends. Right? He's, he's given them favor before the king. He's caused them to prosper and thrive. And the Daniel chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 are all about how God continues to show himself faithful to preserve them and to keep them as they continue to show themselves faithful to him. And yet, there's that end at verse 21. It's really easy to overlook it. You know, Daniel was faithful, and yet, did you notice it says... And Daniel was there in Babylon until the first year of King Cyrus. Well, who was King Cyrus? Well, I just read, I read to you about that earlier. Remember when the guy, King Belshazzar, you know, has the feast 
and he gets overthrown, well, the, the guy Darius the Mede is the same guy. It, it's basically saying Daniel, in verse 21, remained in Babylon until the end of the Babylonian Empire. Like, he was there, we know later. He was there for the rest of his life. And that's where it's good to, as Christians to recognize the sort of nuances of God's faithfulness. God showed himself immensely faithful to Daniel. If you keep reading, you know, these stories in Daniel's 1 to 6 are favorites among Christians and especially young people. You've got you know, the, the fiery furnace and Daniel being rescued from the lions and the, the dream that he interprets and all these things where God obviously shows himself faithful and caring for Daniel. And yet, even in the end, Daniel never, ever gets what he most wants in the world. Like, Daniel just wants to be able to go home back to Judah, and he never goes there. He never gets the thing that he most wanted temporally in this world. He remained there until he died. And we know that from reading, continuing on in the book, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 13, Daniel is told, but you go your way till the end, and you shall rest, and then shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. God, God basically tells Daniel, you're never going to get back home. But God still shows himself faithful to Daniel. And as we conclude, it's just good to recognize that you know, we as Christians... You know, live as exiles in the world. I think sometimes people hear from somebody like me who has moved my family from the United States to another country, and that is hard. I mean, there are hard things about living in a place that's not familiar. We've enjoyed being back in Texas. I've enjoyed being back in a place that's just effortlessly familiar in many ways, and we like that. I like Texas food too much. I felt that when I put on these pants this morning. So. We've enjoyed being here and many good things about it. But, you know, it's, it's good to remember that we're all living as exiles in this world and that this is a fallen world. And part of the, the unsatisfied longings that we have in this life, I think they just remind us more clearly maybe than others that we're, we're not at home. This isn't where we finally live as Christians. And I'd encourage you, you know, Daniel and his friends would have had a very different story if they had had sort of a must-have attitude about their faithfulness. If they said, you know, we're going to serve and be faithful to God as soon as he gives us the one thing we want, like gets us back home to Judah. You know, if if you're a person who has sort of must-haves in your life, like I'm, I'm happy to serve God, but I must have this in order to do it, be careful about that. You know, God, God has already done for us in Christ the only real must-have. Like he's, he's made a way for sinners like us who deserve hell and judgment to be reconciled to him. And he's prepared at the end of days a final eternal home for all of us. But we're going to live as exiles until then. Whether you stay in Texas the rest of your life, or you live in a place like Turkey, or whether, whether you don't have some of your other desires fulfilled in life, you know, whether, whether you wish to be married and you never are, or you wish for a family and you don't have it, or you wish for a different job or a different place to live, or if you, yeah, God hasn't promised that he'll meet all of our temporal desires. But what he has done is he has shown himself to be faithful, and he's made eternal promises that he will keep so that our prosperity is not rooted in what happens to us right now, but it's rooted in what has happened through the gospel and what will happen in the future. And so 
part of what we do as Christians is to wait patiently in exile wherever we are. And that's, that's a message that should give us hope, even if our greatest earthly desires go unfulfilled, because God is faithful. He has been faithful, and he will be faithful. God always will be faithful to his promises. And that's finally what we hope in as Christians. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a good God who always shows yourself faithful. Lord, you showed yourself faithful over and over in the life of Daniel. You showed yourself supremely faithful in what you accomplished through Christ on the cross. And Father, we pray that you would cause us to have confidence that, that you will show yourself faithful in eternity. And God, we pray that you would help us to trust in you to that end until the end of days when we receive our allotted inheritance through Christ. And we pray for that in Jesus' name.